everyone, and welcome back to the cafe. My name is Ryan, and I'm here with your co-host Kelly. Here, you have tuned into episode seven of the Nichi Bay Cafe, a mixed plate of Japanese American news and culture. This month features my favorite and Ryan's favorite topic: food. This monthly live stream program is brought to you by the Nichi Bay Foundation and Nichi Bay Weekly through the benevolence of the Henry and Tomoya Takahashi Charitable Foundation. If you enjoy what we're doing here at the cafe, be sure to leave a like on this video and hit that subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, feel free to leave us a comment if you have any suggestions for future episodes or just want to say hi. In this episode, we will unveil a preview of our annual day of giving, visit a Nikkei wine festival, visit some local Japanese American markets, a tofu maker on the island of Hawaii, as well as features from our regular contributors such as Namiko Chen of Just One Cookbook, Linda Mihara of Paper Tree, and Ryan Tatsumoto, the Gochiso Gourmet. It's essentially a preview of our annual food issue, which hits the streets today. So uh, without further delay, let's start the cafe. So for the appetizer tonight, we can start sipping on the Nikkei wine event in San Francisco. Our executive producer Kenji Tagama visited this unique event recently at San Francisco's Sequoia Sake, along with contributing writer Sam Kang. Kanpai. For decades, the Bay Area has been a world-class destination for wine enthusiasts, drawing millions of visitors to Napa, Sonoma, and even the burgeoning Livermore Valley. But on July 17th, a group of Nikkei winemakers tried something new. Hosting a wine tasting event at Sake Brewery in an industrial park in southeastern San Francisco. However unlikely the setting and circumstances, this sold out event may have awakened the Bay Area to an under the radar class of California wines. Kenbi Nami, and I'm one of the organizers for today's uh, Nikkei wine tasting event here at Sakoya Sake in South San Francisco. The idea was from Nori, Noriko Kame of Sakoya Sake, who uh, came up with the idea of hosting this uh, event featuring uh, Nikkei and Japanese and Japanese American winemakers in, uh, in California. Our, our goal is to uh, create a networking group amongst Japanese American uh, and Japanese winemakers here. Hi, my name is Byron Kasugi. My brand is Byron Kasugi Munch, or B Kasugi Munch, as it's abbreviated on the label. I uh, specialize in Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Gamay, some of which is from Carneros, and some of which is from the Sonoma Coast. Hi there, I'm Jason Mikami from Mikami Vineyards, yeah. and for us, uh, we've been growing grapes uh, for about 120 years now in Lodi, and uh, in the 60s, my father, after the war, purchased the 15-acre vineyard that I was born and raised in, and it's from that vineyard that uh, today we're actually producing our wines. Today we make about four different wines, uh, about 500 cases of wine in total, still very much a small boutique winery. But uh, part of this is really to honor my father and grandfather for, for everything they, they did. Hi, my name is Joey Ovenstone. I'm here pouring Pong Pai wines at Sequoia Sake. We are a Japanese Taiwanese owned uh, winery in Napa Valley. Uh, it all started in 2017 with Hinotori Rose, that uh, means Bird of Fire, and we take the proceeds from this wine and we donate it to a scholarship fund for the children of firefighters. It's our way of giving back to the community. Uh, we've been doing it since 2017, and we've been doing it ever since. Hi, uh, my name is Sonoe. I'm the, uh, the wine producer called Six Foot Wines. I am uh, originally from Nagano, Manchini. I grew up in uh, the area for the fam well, with the family of sake and miso making. And I uh, have been making wine since uh, 2017 under my brand. And I have been sourcing grapes from Napa and the uh, Sonoma area. And I am uh, making the wine so that I can let the grapes shine with my sense of a uh, touch of Japanese flavor. Hi, my name is Yasu Hayashi. I make wine in Napa Valley. I learned from Scott McLeod. He's American. And then from 2011, I learned from Philip Basco from uh, France, Bordeaux, France. He is a winemaker of uh, Chateau Margaux. I learned from two great winemakers. 
I've been making wine from year 2000. I used to work for Ingunuk Winery. And then I left there in uh, 2014 to make my own brand. I've been making wine for other people since the mid-80s, so 1985, so 37 years. Um, I started making my own wine in 2004. I made Pinot from the Sonoma Coast and from Carneros. In uh, 2008, I started making Chardonnay as well. That comes from, and it has come from, from since day one, from the Sonoma Coast. Uh, and then more recently, I added a Gamay Noir to my lineup. Our winemaker is Steve Mathiason. Uh, he's a, a well-renowned James Beard Award nominee, uh, San Francisco Chronicle uh, Winemaker of the Year. He makes low uh, alcohol, high acid, very balanced, food-friendly wines. So I make Chardonnay from uh, the grapes grown in uh, the Oakno Napa, and I also make a red blend for the Magnolia. Uh, also organic grapes and grown by my friends from a UC Davis who's been uh, growing organic grapes in the area. I make uh, two Cabernet Sauvignon. One is my white label, uh, Bon Odor. White label is a more lighter style. You can enjoy now, food friendly. Other one is uh, my black label, Paulonia Cabernet Sauvignon. Then, Paulonia is the name of my wine. My black label has more color and tanning, more bigger wine, more Napa style. But I don't want to make a too overpowering wine, so I'm trying to make an elegant wine. That's my style of wine. Uh, I guess what you'd say, the defining, defining principle to my wines, uh, there's a couple of them. One of them is to be as natural as possible without being a natural winemaker. By that I mean allowing the grapes the fullest possible expression and not adding a lot of stuff to them. In the process of aging them, finishing them, and bottling them, I try to put as little into and also take out as little from the wines as I can. And that doesn't mean that I do nothing, but the, the goal is to preserve as much as possible the flavor of the grape, flavor of the vineyard, um, and to, to some extent even the flavor of the vintage yeah. that goes into the, into the wine. I think the, the biggest thing about our wines is that um, you know, our, our goal in our winemaking process is to really try and produce an elegant style wine. What that basically means is not something that's over the top in terms of uh, food or alcohol perspective. We want to make sure that we have uh, plenty of acidity to really make the wines uh, stand out. And we also are trying to do this in a very handcrafted way. We're a small lot. So as I mentioned before, we only make about 500 cases of wine here, a year total. So it really is a labor of love and we're really trying to produce that elegant style of wine. And especially here at Kompai, we, we think what do we want to eat first and then we find a wine to, to pair with it. We create that wine. So all of our wines are made with food pairings in mind. Uh, we do a lot of Asian food wine pairings. Our Chardonnay specifically is meant to be paired with sushi, sashimi, uh, just light, flavorful Japanese food. Uh, so it all starts with a conversation about food and who we want to drink with, friends, family, and point. And also, I'm trying to manage the tanning during the fermentation. Yeah, I use a uh, usually do 21 days fermentation, but uh, depend on the vintage, sometimes a little bit shorter, mm -hmm. sometimes a little bit longer. So it depends on the here I need to uh, manage the uh, wine, it depends on the level of the tannin. So okay. that's my yeah, style. For more information about Sequoia Sake, go to sequoiasake.com. Public tasting is offered at their brewery on Saturdays from 12 to 6 p.m. For more information about the Nikkei winemakers, visit bkosugewines.com, kampai.wine, mikamivineyards.com, pauloniawine.com, and sixcloveswine.com. the various Nikkei wine and sake makers for introducing themselves to our Nichibei Cafe audience. After this week, I could really use some wine right now, right Kelly? Way ahead of you, Ryan. 
Is that your third cup? For our salad segment, our producer Greg Valoria visited a multi-generational tofu maker on the island of Oahu to see what they are up to. Aloha! In an unassuming part of Honolulu, we visited a small multi-generational tofu manufacturer, Aloha Tofu Factory. The company has been in business since 1950 and at their current location at Akepo Lane since 1976. We sat down with this man. My name is Paul Uihara. Uh, I am the president slash custodian of Aloha Tofu Factory. Where Paul goes over the history of his family-run business. Our, our company, at least with our family, uh, started in 1950. My uh, grandfather, he had an opportunity to take over a, a small little tofu factory from his friend. Uh, the friend happened to be operating a small tofu factory, tofu shop, I guess, and a, a pig farm. And, you know, both of them are, are really full-time jobs. So he kind of offered my grandfather. And my father, uh, my grandfather, took up that opportunity. Um, and he had, they had uh, six children, so four boys and two girls. Um, that was the second generation. And so uh, eventually, actually, they all uh, joined the business and they all worked in the factory. Um, so it, was, it really was a family business. Um, and, you know, growing up, my cousins and my sisters, we all kind of went through the factory working. Um, <laughs> and I guess uh, I'm the only one left who decided to continue with it. You know, from high school, you start thinking about what your future is going to be like, what you want to do. And I thought, um, you know, at least just personally myself, I thought, uh, you know, if nobody else wants to come and take over in the, the next generation, my cousins or my sisters, then I would be willing to come back. So I thought, you know, as long as there was somebody else to, to continue on this, this uh, uh, I guess a legacy, uh, you know, but but you know, it became a little bit more than that. Um, then I would, you know, just continue and, and do other things. But if there wasn't a lot of interest, and, and you know, I, I thought there's a chance for me to come back, then I would join the family business. Their unique logo pays homage to its founders, Suruko and Kame Saburo Uehara. Uh, actually, the, the original logo was, uh, I think, developed by my father, and it was kind of to honor uh, my grandparents. Um, so if you uh, look on the outside of our factory, or, or if you see this logo, you can see there are two animals, and they're very traditional Japanese animals. Um, one is, um, I'm not sure if you could take a look, but one is a, a, a turtle, and then one is a crane. And the reason for that is, uh, my, my grandparents, uh, my, my grandfather's name was Kame Saburo. So Kame in Japanese is turtle. And my grandmother's name was uh, Tsuruko. And Tsuru is a uh, Japanese crane. And in Japanese folk folklore, um, it's a very uh, lucky combination, the Kame and Tsuru, Tsuru Kame. Uh, you know, to me, it's kind of a way to always remember my, my grandparents, the founders, and also, um, you know, the the tsuru, the crane, is kind of eternally hugging the, the kame in a way, yeah. Influenced by Kiyosera's founder, Kazuo Inamori, who believed in small, empowered work groups, Paul shared a secret employee spot in the back of the factory to help them relax and get away. What I decided, what we decided to do is make it a, an extra break room for the workers. So... Whoa, tatami! Tatami mat. Oh my God. So it's new, it smells new. But you know, during the summer, it can't beat tatami, yeah. Aloha Tofu is the biggest maker of tofu in Hawaii. They make 2,500 to 3,000 blocks a day. Not only regular tofu is popular, they make several products and are the only maker of natto in Hawaii. So our, our basic product line really hasn't changed uh, very much since my, um, my dad's time, the second generation's time. 
Um, you know, we have a firm, we have a soft tofu. Uh, we don't have different levels of, of firmness. It's just kind of a medium, uh, middle of the road kind of firm. And then our soft is a, uh, it's called a juten style, which means the process is that it's poured into the container as soy milk with a coagulant and it's sealed and then it's, it, it coagulates into a, a tofu itself. Um, and that technology my, my dad brought over, you know, back gosh, 30, 30 years ago, maybe more. Um, and I, I think we're still the only company in, in the States actually that, that does that. Japanese company, they do that all the time. They, they have many, many companies like that who, who do that process. When we spoke with Paul, he felt very confident in the future. It's nice. It's, it's a very nice thing to say, like, you know, there's, there's a legacy from you know, three or four or five generations. As for the future, you know, uh, our focus now is not on our family and, you know, what's good for the family. Uh, the focus is really on what's good for our, uh, our employees, our, our partners. We call them partners, our employees, um, and the community. You know, how we can continue to serve the community with uh, fresh tofu products. And we hope that Aloha Tofu serves this community for years to come. This is Greg Valoria for Nichi Bay Cafe. Our main courses are about to arrive. Our first main course consists of some treats from San Jose's Santo Market. We took a trip to San Jose's Japantown recently to drop in on Mark Santo and try some delicious ahi poke, strawberry mochi, and homemade char shu bao. What's up guys? It's Ryan. And it's Kelly. We're here at Santo Market and we got some delicious food here from San Jose's Japantown. Santo Market was started in 1946 by actually my dad's uncle, George Santo. And then when my dad came out of the service, lucky for me, he asked my dad if he wanted to be a part of the store. And like I said, lucky for me, so hence I am now running the store since it was kind of passed over to my father. They actually started on Jackson Street in 1946. About 10, 11 years later, I believe in 57, they moved to this location. I started here back in high school. I worked here through my high school and college years. Upon graduating college, father wanted me to work out, so I went to work for an electronics company for about five years. And after that point, I came back to the store. At that point, I was just kind of helping my dad since he was still here really running the store. And little by little, I started taking over more of the responsibilities, doing more of the ordering, organizing the employees, and doing the scheduling for that kind of thing. To me, actually, the, the pandemic changed our operation, made it kind of a little bit better for us. We closed our stores and my dad had some windows we're using for coffee service over here. So our coffee windows now became our service windows and we're serving our store through a couple of service windows. We aren't looking to reopen the doors anytime soon. Everything seems to be working out where we're able to sell what we have through the windows and we were able to maintain our business and um, keep, keep everything flowing there. We don't have as many grocery items like we did before, uh, but we still have the main basics. So a lot of the things we do has been geared toward the community, helping the Buddhist church, the Methodist church, and a couple other churches in the neighborhood, and all the youth groups that kind of come from them. We, you know, we, we try to help them as much as we can for their fundraisers, for any activities they do. Gotta keep the community strong. Really like to try to continue the store, mainly legacy for my mom and dad, for what they have established and what they have built up over here. For the next generation, we've had them kind of talk about it and they've inquired. And now it's to see if somebody really wants to grab the store and go run with it. Always open and I'm waiting for them. <laughs> Our 
best selling thing now is kind of revolving around our deli, which is mainly our pokey we were selling. We do a lot of local moco, Portuguese sausage eggs, spam and eggs. And we also do a flank steak. So we do a flank steak where we tenderize it, marinate it in teriyaki sauce, and then we do a flour egg and we fry it up like that. So that's also one of my favorites. So here's our uh, one of our poke bowls. This is kind of what has been carrying us since, during the pandemic. I was pretty lucky. I got a couple of nice recipes from a friend in Hawaii. Uh, so he gave us a good shoyu poke recipe and a spicy poke recipe. It was something we were kind of, all, you know, you're always searching for that one product that's going to be one to kick you over the edge. And we think this is the one that did it for us. We do our Moore's Hawaiian style week where we make our pokey in the morning. So we start off with all of our pokey kind of pre-made and it, it goes from there. So it's been marinating for a couple hours to be as tasty as possible. So the shoyu pokey is like this, it's a shoyu based pokey there. But there's a couple other ingredients we added to ours that a lot of places may not know. Us bringing in Hawaii products, I knew like the limu they add to it and the kukui nut. So it's kind of more of a classical pokey where a lot of the old timers from Hawaii, when they see we have a limu pokey, they taste the kukui nut in there. It just gives them, a, a, a really reminds them of being at home, getting their pokey from there. We hear from a lot of our customers that uh, our pokey reminds them of them growing up or them getting the pokey when they go either vacation Hawaii or those who lived in Hawaii. We used to use a bowl, actually our noodle bowl, put the rice on the bottom, the pokey on that. And we just felt that being hot rice, raw tuna, unless they ate it right away, it was kind of changing the texture and the quality of the product. So we decided to split it into two so the pokey will still stay as cool as possible and the rice will be in the side, so that'll stay hot. And this here's our strawberry mochi. This actually got started when my parents took a vacation to Hawaii. One of the first we asked them upon coming home was, what new things or different things did you try in Hawaii? And first thing they mentioned is they tried a strawberry daifuku from Hawaii. And a couple weeks later, we started looking how to make it, start doing experimenting it, and we end up making our own strawberry daifuku here. So this is actually probably our second best seller after our pokey. We make them on Tuesdays and Saturdays. We recommend you come before 10 o'clock if you want to try to pick it up or give us a call so we could set an order aside for you or call a couple days in advance and place an order that we can get it for you that way. Nowadays, like I said, it always sells out. If we have it till 11 o'clock, it's a slow day. <laughs> uh, they can find us at in San Jose at the corner of 6th and Taylor. Our address is 245 East Taylor, but we're right on the corner of North 6th and East Taylor in Japantown. Thank you to Santo Market for all the wonderful food. Yep. What are you, where's Kelly? You were supposed to be watching her. I'm not. If you're in the San Jose area, please drop by Santo Market Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we would also like to acknowledge the recent passing of Mark Santo's father, Earl Santo, the second generation owner of the market. Next up, our team of myself, Kelly, and our summer intern, Jay, sat down to and tasted some lunchtime savory treats from Takahashi Market in San Mateo. We had a blast sampling all of the Hawaiian-inspired foods. Ichibei Cafe went down to San Mateo to Takahashi Market to talk to Jean and Bobby Takahashi on what they do here and how they have evolved throughout the pandemic. We started in 1906. We made the kitchen to coincide with our centennial. So 2006 is when our commercial kitchen was installed. Up until then, we had been doing a few things like, like poke, but 
2006 is when we actually had a commercial kitchen, so we were able to start offering um, plate, hot plate lunches and things like that. We started carrying Hawaiian food in the, I think, the late 50s, early 60s, because at that time it was hard to find just the Asian food in general. And I think about that time is when the San Francisco airport uh, was, being, was being built, and a lot of Hawaiian customers came into us because they had a, a lot of them came out here to work for the airport. And my father was able to secure vendors in Hawaii to bring, bring some of those things in. And my son does a better job than I ever did. The whole family is really proud of Bobby. We're, we're glad he's, he's doing a good job taking over the place. He really got us through the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, he's the one who helped us pivot all our operations. And we were very proud of the fact that he was, his main concern was taking care of our, our older customers. He wanted to make sure the social distancing was, was set up right away. In fact, he wouldn't let me come into work for a few weeks because he kept saying, no, Dad, you know, you're, you're too old. You can't be around <laughs> I'm enjoying it a lot more and more, the more I get involved. And it's, um, yeah, it's getting a little easier each day, too. The more we get, everyone here gets more comfortable with it, too. I mean, it's, um, it's part of who I am. I mean, I grew up here every single day watched it grow into what it is now and all with my family with me too so it really it really does mean a lot to me i'd kind of lose lose my mind a little bit if i'm not here for too long our customers here are really a big reason why we're able to just stay open and not have to worry too much about it i was really glad to see all of our customers coming in during the pandemic really made me want to come back and keep keep things moving and keep things open just make sure I'm there for them too and then I yeah right after people starting vaccinated all of our regular customers all like the the Sanseis and the yeah Niseis too actually but then yeah they all started coming back in too and it was really it was really great to see everyone I mean I think what we have here is it works really well all the staff is happy we're not like super stressed out one thing that I did start to do that I want to kind of get going more was that we started doing malasadas. They're old time customers that just started making malasadas like 10 years ago. And they were super small. And then now in the past uh, year now, they got their own truck and they were able to move around to different farmers markets. Me and Randy and Dee started working things out and trying to get them in here more regularly. I want to kind of do things like that where I meet, meet really good people and just kind of let them sell whatever they like here, you know? As long as they want to do it and as they enjoy doing it, like we're more than happy to welcome them in too. We try to make our poke as close to Hawaiian style as possible. Cubes of fresh tuna, a little bit of Hawaiian salt, soy sauce, a little bit of sesame oil, fresh Hawaiian seaweed, green onions, sweet onions. And then for the hot version, it's the same thing except uh, a little bit of extra chili on it. The tuna we get from the, our, most of our, mostly from our Japanese suppliers. And the, the seaweed we bring in fresh from Hawaii, we have to air freight that in because it is hard to find out here. I remember around 75 was one of my first trips to Hawaii, and that's one of the first times I ever had it. And I was thinking, wow, this, I mean, we, we already sold sashimi, but we figured this is something that we, we need to put onto our menu. This is a loco moco. Normally the loco mocos you find in Hawaii, they're just a regular beef patty, but ours is more like a meatloaf, like a seasoned ground beef with all of uh, like all the fixings you would have for a meatloaf. And that's probably my favorite thing to eat growing up too. So I made I wanted to make sure that the loco moco was up to up to bar. The musubis are definitely the most popular thing here now. And these are just a few of them. Uh, there's salmon crawfish, kalua pork cabbage, and the salmon belly musubi. Salmon crawfish, probably my favorite of the three here so far. But by numbers alone, spam is still the number one seller. Many of the foods served at Takahashi Market come from family recipes that were passed down through the Takahashi generations. Others are inventions from Bobby's childhood or ones he has come up with himself in recent years. Like the salmon crawfish is, uh, <laughs> that was, we used to just kind of make that ourselves, just with the salmon plate. But we used to like crush it up and mix it with the crawfish salad and scramble it with eggs. 
and that was our breakfast a lot of the times, and it's really good. So that's why we're like, oh, put it into a musubi too. It is now time for some amateur food reviewing with co-hosts Kelly and Ryan and Nikkei community intern Jay. First up, Loco Moco. said it's really like sweet but it, there's also like salty notes in there it balances well again with the egg if you don't have loco moco with green onions on it what, what are you, you doing do? it's really good for some reason i thought the foods kalbi taste came from the gravy but i just tried the patty and it actually comes from the patty and so i don't know what they did but it tastes really good <laughs> but they did it right they did it extremely right the seasoning of the patty was really good i agree i again have no original thoughts <clears throat> but i also want to say that the rice is really good like, I feel like sometimes you go to places and the food will be good, but then the rice is kind of like dry or Meh. subpar. But this is actually really good rice, and I really like rice, so that was an extreme plus for me. It's time to try some poke. Time for some poke. <laughs> I got the spicy one. Ooh, looks like tuna. <laughs> tuna. It's kind of spicy, <laughs> but the texture of the fish is amazing. It like almost melts in your mouth. It's so delicious and fresh and the seaweed is nice and crunchy and the scallions are also nice and crunchy. The and sauce is really good. I love the seaweed the seaweed in this. It's good. I will finish the entire thing. Oh, oh I got this I got the spicy one. I got some not spicy. Mm. Also very good. Is there a lot of spice in there? Or is it kinda of like mild? Mine's not spicy. Mm. It's like they don't listen when I talk. It's like a very traditional simple poke which I very much appreciate in these days of poke appropriation. It's not wrong. I appreciate how simple this is with just like sauce, tuna, seaweed, scallions, onion. I mean, I would call this traditional Hawaiian poke, even though we're not in Hawaii. So that's definitely a plus. But yeah, this measures up really well to a lot of poke that I've had. Flavor's really good. It's really rich. I do wish I had some rice. That's just on me for poor planning, honestly. But it is really good. <laughs> the end of Amateur Food Review with Kelly, Ryan, and Jay. Thanks for joining us. Located in the Temescal neighborhood of Oakland is a hidden Japanese specialty store, Umami Mart. Akiko Minaga and I sat down with... My name is Kaya Guacabori and I am the co-founder here at Umami Mart. To discover the hidden Japanese treasures of Umami Mart. We started out as a food blog in 20... 2007 and we opened our first brick and mortar in downtown Oakland in 2012 uh, with my business partner Yoko Kumano. And Yoko and I wanted to keep Umami Mart going as a blog but we didn't want to advertise or anything so we were trying to make it into some kind of a viable business. Uh, so we decided to start importing barware from Japan which one of our writers had told us was kind of a really hot thing in the States right now between bartenders. So uh, we took his advice and started importing the barware, which is how we started. Kayoko explains what you will find at Umami Mart. No, I mean, I think we like um, to have something for everybody, you know, who is a food enthusiast or, you know, might be wellness enthusiast. We, you know, we carry a lot of different genre of things but we do try to kind of keep it drinks focused as much as possible yeah you know we like to make sure that it's 
practical, you know, easy to use, but you know, and well designed. I think J Japanese products are all of those things, you know, and I think that um, the craftsmanship in Japan is not disappearing, but the artisans are definitely, there's a decline of the artisans and for example, the glassware, there's becoming fewer and fewer people who are able to make stemware or the specialty glassware. Uwami Mart also offers a sake shochu gumi or club where one could sample some great selections of sake and or shochu picked skillfully by co-founder Yoko Kumano. Yes, we have uh, sake gumi um, and shochu gumi. So sake gumi is a monthly sake subscription that we ship nationwide. Most of our uh, members are local and they pick up every month here. Yoko is the sake, um, kikizake shi. Uh, so she directs all of, not just the sake gumi, but just all of the sakes that we carry is uh, through her expertise. Uh, but for sake gumi, she writes the tasting notes every month and it's under a theme. Koyoko also talks about the current and future offerings at Umami Mart. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we're, we're really working on expanding our bar and, you know, we definitely have been shopkeepers and retailers for 10 years, and, but the bar is just a whole new terrain for us and, you know, it kind of started to ramp up by the time the pandemic started and so we kind of just lost a lot of that momentum so we're kind of just starting to get back into it little by little uh yeah doing lots of events at the bar um and yeah you know we also reopened the bar this year or l late last year we reopened the bar with a hard alcohol license. So we opened with just a beer and wine license which offered sake, but now we could do high spirit shochu, uh, high proof shochu, gin, whiskey um, drinks. And so the whiskey flights have been very popular and definitely offering cocktails is really a new thing for us as well. It's our 10th year and we're really, we wouldn't be here without our community and we hope that our community keeps growing. You know, it definitely helps that we're online and, um, but yeah, we kind of like to, you know, we like to say that we like to bring joy through our products. With the bright, airy feel of the store, who wouldn't find joy at Umami Mart? This is Greg Voria for Akiko Managa for the Michibe Cafe. Told me to sit here and then he ran away. Oh, well, good riddance. So, do I do Brian's part? Yeah, you'll probably do it better than he can, so go for it, Jay. It's time for dessert. Namiko Chen of Just One Cookbook will now wow you with her honey sesame shirataki noodles recipe. Konnichiwa, it's Nami from Just One Cookbook. Today I wanted to show you a great dish for warm summer days. This delicious honey sesame noodle is served with egg clay, chicken, and cucumber, and it is so flavorful and refreshing. The dish is made with these shirataki noodles, which are made from a type of fiber that comes from the root of konnyaku or yam. The best part is that they are low in carbs, with zero grams of fat and cholesterol. They also don't stick together because they don't have starch, so you can make this dish ahead of time. It's the perfect guilt-free summer noodles that are low in calories. So let me show you how to put it together.
or give this a try and let me know what you think. Subscribe for more easy Japanese recipes and you can click here to print this recipe. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Mata ne! I had to run down to the post office to get those Day of Giving mailers. How was Jay? Better than you. Thank you very much to Namiko for this delicious recipe. In this episode, we are offering you a second dessert. Linda Mihara of Paper Tree teaches us how to fold an origami carrot. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Linda Mihara, and I'm a columnist for the Nichibei Weekly. I do an origami column called Origami Now. And in today's episode, I'm going to show you how to do a really cool carrot. Very simple to do. You need two sheets of paper, so one in a nice bright orange, carrot orange, and one in some green, a nice green color. So having that, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start by folding the carrot part first. So I'm taking my orange paper, and we want to have it face down and we're going to fold it into a triangle. So let's take our opposite points, line them up together, and hold it in place. So the key here is to make sure you hold it in place with one hand first, and then with your other hand, pull straight down the middle. That kind of sets the fold, and then you can go to the right and left, and that way it doesn't move on you, and you get a nice, accurate triangle like you have here. So after you do that, let's unfold it. You'll see that you have a nice line, fold line that goes right down the middle of this, uh, the square, and what we're going to do is what I call a paper airplane fold. I think most of you have done a paper airplane. And basically what we're going to do is take this edge and we're going to bring it to meet the center crease line like this. And the trick is to go up to but not across that center crease. That way you have a nice, even, and accurate fold. So it should look just like this. And the same thing for the opposite side. So we're going to take that edge and bring it up to meet the center. So it's like a paper airplane. It comes to a point. That's the bottom of the carrot. And then go ahead and fold. So now you have what looks like this. After you have that, let's go ahead and this part here, this white triangle that's up in here, let's take that and just fold it down just right along the edge of those two flaps that we've just folded so it'll look just like this. Got an upside down triangle here. And now just two more steps. On these points here, we're going to fold it in at a slight angle and it's gonna look like this. We wanna shape the top part of the carrot. So this is to taste. If you wanna make a skinnier carrot, you can move it down a little bit, but I think this is a good you know, a good angle to do that. And then match the other side to go ahead and meet that. So we're going to bring that corner over to meet the center right at the point with the other side. So here is your shape. After you have that, just turn it over and here is your carrot. So let's go ahead and put that aside and let's work on the greens. So I have my green sheet of origami paper. We want to start by turning it over so that the green side is face down. And we're going to do the same thing by folding it into a triangle. So let's go ahead and take the opposite points, hold it in place at the top, take your other hand and pull straight down the middle till you get to the bottom, and then go ahead and fold it to the right and the left so you have a nice triangle like this. Now what we're going to do is bring, I'm going to rotate this so that your view of it should be just like this. We're going to bring this point up to meet the top of the triangle, like this and make your crease. And then the same for the opposite point. We're gonna take this point and bring that to the top as well. So you have this. Now what we're going to do is those two flaps, we're going to fold them out at an angle. And what we're going to do is take this edge and we're going to fold it out to meet this edge here, just like this. So it's kind of a, a reverse paper airplane fold. It's not going in, it's going out. So it should be, it should look just like this. We're gonna match that to the other side. So let's take this flap, and from the inside, you're going to open it out, and make sure it lines up with that outer edge there and it comes to a point down here. So your model should look just like this. 
So now let's turn it over to the other side. So let's flip it over. And what we're going to do is fold it in half right through the middle here. So let's bring this, the points over. If you match the points, then you've, you've got it made. So then we're going to go ahead and fold it. So it kind of looks like this little arrow. And then a final step is to take the top flap. It's actually two, two layers. There's this layer and this layer. And you're just going to fold it kind of in half in this section here. So we're going to take both layers and fold it in half. One long dart, so it should look just like this. And then you turn it over. That's your little green part. So you're going to go ahead and if you look at the back of the carrot, there's a little pocket that you have here. So you're going to take the greens and you're going to slip it right inside there. You can put a little piece of tape there if you want. And that is your completed carrot. For more videos on some fun things to do, you could check out our YouTube channel, which is Paper Tree SF. But also the Nietzsche Bay Weekly has a wonderful YouTube channel as well with my other videos from the things that we've had in the, in the newspaper. And that is for the Nietzsche Bay Foundation channel on YouTube. Happy folding! A big thanks to Linda for teaching us how to fold. It's my favorite time of the night, Ryan. Time for the nightcap. Uh, you, you finished your nightcap earlier. Wink so. wonk. This month we bring back the Gochiso Gourmet, Ryan Tatsumoto from Kaneohe, Hawaii, who will be teaching us how to make a cocktail he calls the Almost on Vacation. Let's check it out. I wish I was almost on vacation. Hi, it's Ryan Tatsumoto, the Gochiso Gourmet, for another cocktail session where it's always 5 p.m. Today's cocktail I call the Almost on Vacation. I technically should rename this because I first made this cocktail while I was still part of the productive workforce. I retired recently, so I probably need to make another one, always on vacation, but that's in the future. So the Almost on Vacation was created because during when you're working and you take a one week vacation, what is the worst day? I don't think it's the Monday that you go back to work. It's like that Sunday afternoon where you realize, oh, the vacation's over, I gotta go back to work again. Ah! So I felt like that after this one par particular vacation. I wanted something refreshing, take my mind off of it. It was a hot day, so I wanted to create a refreshing cocktail. I made this, it sounded pretty good. It tasted pretty good, so I said, hey, this is almost like being on vacation. I went, ding! Maybe I should name it the Almost on Vacation. So it starts out with a half ounce each of yellow chartreuse. Half ounce of elderflower liqueur. One ounce of gin. And what I'm gonna do is start the uh, cooling off process in my little uh, pitcher of ice here. Stir it for about 15, 20 seconds, or just when you feel the glass start to start getting a chill. And this also dilutes the cocktail a little. I'm gonna pour it on the rocks, so oh, my strainer, in an old fashioned glass. And finally, I'm gonna top it with about two ounces of tonic water. I really like this Q-Tonic. Uh, basically, the story goes, the person who started this company um, loved gin and tonics, 
But one day he asked himself, why am, am I mixing my $40 or $50 bottle of gin with a $1.99 bottle of Schweppes or Canada Dry Tonic Water? Number one, the uh, big commercial brands don't have as much of the uh, quinine from the Cincona plant and they're heavily fortified with high fructose corn syrup so it's almost like a cloying sweetness. So he created this uh, product which uses quinine specifically from the Cincona uh, bark and he also sweetens, sweetens it with the agave uh, syrup. So it's not as sweet and it has a little more of that bitter quality that tonic water is used for. I highly encourage you to find this. If I can find this in the 50th, I'm pretty sure you can find it in your neck of the woods. And I'm gonna give just a little quick stir just to incorporate the tonic water. And add a little squeeze of lime. Rub the outside on the glass and pop it in. So again, I'm the Gochiso Gourmet and this is almost on vacation. Kampai! For the tips today, we will list all of the events to close out the summer and move into the fall. But first, we would like to thank everyone for continuing to support our YouTube channel. We recently hit 500 subscribers. Let's shoot for 1,000, baby! Let's go! If you enjoy what we're doing here at the cafe, please be sure to leave a like on this video and hit that subscribe button for more content just like this. And uh, also feel free to leave us a comment or message on Facebook if you have any suggestions for future episodes or just want to say hi. Now, on to the listing of events. Back to join us on Monday, September 5th as we present our Nichibei Day of Giving telecast featuring live raffle drawings as we try to reach our fundraising goals during our annual webathon. Visit www.nichibei.org slash give to Nichibei for details on how you can contribute. Thanks, Thanks again, again for, for joining, joining us at, at the Nichibei, Nichibei Cafe. Cafe.
The sixth annual Nichibei Day of Giving, our largest fundraiser of the year, is coming up on September 5th. Your generous support can help us maintain or expand staff capacity, create reserve funding, continue to support our community's pandemic recovery, and reach our fundraising goal of a record $150,000. If we reach $50,000, we will receive a $50,000 matching donation from the Craig Foundation. You can help us out by making an online donation to the Nichibei Foundation or any of our special funds on or before Monday, September 5th, creating your own fundraising page or team, perhaps in memory of a loved one, and visiting www.nichibei.org slash give to, as in the number two, Nichibei for more details. Those who donate will be eligible for some great thank you gifts, including a free one-year digital edition subscription to the Nichibei Weekly if you donate $100 or more, a free one-year digital edition subscription plus an adjustable Nichibei face mask if you donate $250 to $499, a free one-year premium edition subscription plus a Nichibei tote bag if you donate $500 to $999, and finally, a free two-year premium edition subscription, plus the adjustable Nichibei face mask, plus the Nichibei tote, if you donate $1,000 or more. All donors through September 5th will be eligible for Day of Giving drawings for many different prizes, including one-year subscriptions to masterclass.com, which is a uh, $180 value, featuring courses taught by industry leaders such as Modern Japanese Cooking with Niki Nakayama, Ukulele with Jake Shimabukuro, basketball with Steph Curry, and many more. So don't forget to tune in on Monday, September 5th from 3 to 6 p.m. for our Day of Giving livestream webathon, featuring live raffles for donors throughout the telecast, the best of the Nichibei Cafe, live fundraising updates, staff and board introductions, an introduction to the Nichibei Legacy Society, as well as upcoming events and programs. So please donate today to get some great gifts. It is our way of saying thank you for your very generous support and help us build a legacy for the future by contributing to our sixth annual Nichibei Day of Giving. Please visit www.nichibei.org slash give to Nichibei for more details.